The disease of anxiety and of chronic dissatisfaction, I view it as kind of like diabetes. Diabetics can have rich, amazing lives, live to 100, but on a daily basis, you've got to check your blood sugar level and your insulin. And, and I view kind of living with anxiety and living with dissatisfaction like that. Are you here in Los Angeles? I'm in a little town okay. that shall remain nameless. I will, yeah. That's a little bit north of Los Angeles. Okay, great. Well, yeah. I grew up two hours north. And okay. you are, and Jack actually is about- Santa Barbara north. or? Bakersfield? Oh, okay. Yeah. Different mm -hmm. north. Yeah. So I'm up the coast a little bit. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. that's better. Yeah. That's much better. Good Bakersfield. for you. Okay, Bakersfield. Okay, cool. Bakersfield. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always funny. People in LA are like, oh, where, where? I'm sure I know it when I say it. Everyone's like, oof. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Bakersfield is a challenging area. In a lot of ways. Yeah. In my publicist, um, Hollywood elite, <laughs> my publicist, Kara Trapicchio, uh, who's a top, she does all these Oscar people. She grew up there with her sisters. No yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. She's proud Bakersfield. I never meet anybody yeah, from there. Yeah, so you that's should talk really to her cool. about that connection. Yeah. So did you drive in this morning? I did. Did yeah. it take Six hours? No. It was, okay, good. It was pretty quick. Good. Yeah. And did I, am I making it up? We Well, we can cut this out. Not that people no, can find you yeah. for this, but are you in a truck? Are you rolling a truck or did I make that up? Well, my wife has horses and we have an actual diesel cool. truck to kind of tow her horse trailer around. Yeah. And I had a Tesla for a while and I tried a bunch of different electric cars. It was like moved up from Prius to yes. Volt to, yeah. to Bolt to leaf to the you know i tried them all out and um and i i had an opportunity to get a ford lightning and it's amazing yeah it's, you're loving it yeah uh does she have show horses or jumpers she or? does dressage cool yeah how long has she done that well she did it as a teenager for several years and now she's been doing it for the last 10 years pretty seriously she does competitions and oh, stuff rad. like that she, that's awesome yeah she competes and we have two horses over at this horse ranch out in the wilds of Somas, which is a farm area near Moore Park. And um, yeah, and we also have a donkey out there and we have a zonkey. How'd you get a zonkey? How'd that happen? That's a great story, okay, Rachel. Great. So my wife saw a zonkey somewhere. She went somewhere and she's like, there's a donkey with striped zebra legs. What the hell is going yeah. on? And they're like, that's a zonkey. So she went home. And she literally pulled up Google and went zonkey, <laughs> hit return. And at the top of the page is zebrasrus.com. Zebrasrus.com. They're in Riverside, California. She looks at their website. She picks up the phone. Beep, boop, 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 boop. She's using they're like, hello, zebrasrus.com. <laughs> and yeah, she's using a phone from 1957. Yeah. And then, um, uh, they're like, and she's like, you have zonkeys? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we do. We just, in fact, we just had a little baby boy zonkey born the other day. And she's like, how much is a zonkey? And they're like, $3,000 and we'll deliver it in six months to your house. And she's like, okay. <laughs> Pulls out the credit card and orders a zonkey online. And what, what does one do with a zonkey besides just like aesthetic you know, you, pleasing to the you eye. You pet it and right. cuddle it right. and you walk it around. No, you do not pet it yeah, or cuddle okay. it because it's a wild animal, Rachel. <laughs> It'll kick your face off. It'll bite you in the neck. No, because the zebra part is really wild, but he's gorgeous. His name is Derek and we have a companion rescue uh, donkey and they share a stall and his name is Chili Beans. And then she goes and she walks Derek and Chili Beans and they're very happy they're in a horse stable and there's horses walking around. So they're part of the herd. Checking and, it out. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally they bite and kick each other and, and they work it out. Uh, how did Derek get a better name than Chili Beans? I think they're both excellent names that Very suit their different. personalities. Very So I have a, my dog's name is Jeffrey. So I really okay. love when you name a pet right. a very like distinguished human yeah, name or that name. we yeah. call the dog Jeff, I think is very yeah. funny. <laughs> very but good. Derek's pretty specific. Yeah. My son named him Derek. Okay. At the time, my son was like eight years old. Okay. Yeah. Was there any, re he just was like, that's a kid in my class. And it, it, there wasn't a story. No, it was just okay. like. Let's he looks what like Walter, what do you think we should name him? Derek. Okay, I'm like done. Great. Done. Sold. How many kids y'all have? I have one kid. I have one 
18 and a half year old boy. He's a young, and a half. smelly man okay, who is so headed towards young manhood. Yes, yes. Does that feel scary that he's like officially grown? Or are you guys like, hell yeah? It's so scary. And it's been so difficult raising a teenager in the years of COVID. Oh, God, I right. think COVID for all kids was really hard. But he was right in that just terrible sweet spot of the mental health epidemic with young people. And he missed um, all of his sophomore year mm. and half of his freshman year and a little bit of his junior year because um, uh, of quarantine, yeah. doing Zoom school. Yeah. And it's it was just the worst. It's I, I don't know. Now, we have a lot of resources. So, you know, we, we, you know, he's got a tutor and we both work at home and stuff like that. So, but like a single mom with three teenage kids during the pandemic, I don't know how people survived. Right. I don't know how they did it. It's right. so challenging. And um, the whole idea of like, Hey, don't be on your screens so much. Oh, and by the way, you need to be on your screen all day right. your long. Your whole life is staring now at it. Yeah. Uh is yeah. just uh it's a terrible situation to yeah. be in. Yeah. So you but you got him to adulthood, which is like this is what we're this is what we're working for. So far so good. So far so good. Yeah, yeah. We just did a college tour. We went out to the East Coast. He's looking at some colleges out there and you Does know, that feel good or scary? Yeah, or? it's it's good and scary. Um, we are uh, extremely excited to be empty nesters. Okay, just like get out, get kid. Get the hell like, out go, of here. Go be free, baby right. bird. Fly right. from the nest. Right. And uh, but but it's also it's also terrifying. You know, I think someone asked me the other day, like, what what do you most fear? What is most like not in your control? And I would say, you know my fear for my teenage boy uh, is, and and lack of control around the choices that he makes and mistakes that he's going to make and letting that go is a is an entirely new sensation for me. And it's, that is really terrifying because yeah. you, <clears throat> you try and do everything for your kids, but at a certain point in time, they're gonna be making a lot more of their choices. You hope that you've, you know, nurtured them with a little bit of wisdom um, and, uh, insight and foresight, but you know, they're, especially the boys, like their brains are not wired till they're like 25, yeah. like yeah. physiologically. And, um, the whole COVID thing, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I don't think my son will mind me saying this, like in a lot of ways, today's kids, he's 18 and a half. He has the maturity of like a 27 year old mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, like the way he sees the world you know, and his place in it and what's important. And uh, he, he, and in a lot of ways, he's 18 and a half going on 11. Yeah. You know, and th there's a lot of immaturity there, which happens with all teenagers, but especially during this COVID time, yeah. because there's a, that socializing piece is missing during that year and a half. And that, that's when we really grow. That's really what school is about. Yeah. I mean, who remembers the paper that they wrote on the scarlet letter, right? You, <laughs> you, it's... I have mine framed in the house. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. No, so. I, I totally agreed. I have four kids and that piece that you're talking about yeah. manifests then by every single one and each individual personality type. And mm. three of my four are boys and mm. one of them is very mature and the other two we're gonna we're gonna see how that goes. Yeah. I I have a lot less fear about my oldest son. He's always been super responsible and kind of always wanted to be an adult, like oh, long okay. before he was. Yeah. Uh, but his younger brother, you know, for sure, I'm gonna get a call that's like, you know, he got arrested for doing something crazy, or sure. I'm just yeah. Oh, that sounds that sounds yep. just like that kid. So, yep. um, that is sort of a I don't know the beauty and the tension of being at least for me, of being a parent is like, I have to let you have these moments and yeah. make these mistakes and do these things and experience the consequences of those. Yeah. Because when they were younger, I, I kind of covered for every consequence. If you left your homework at home, mom drove it to school. Like yeah. I, and then at We've some point, that. right. And at some We've point you realize, the teacher yeah. kind of saying, Oh, sorry, Walter yeah. thought he did this, yeah. but can you help him out with this? Like, yeah. 
It's a little bit of right. rescuing, which I right. we vowed not to do, yes. but we yeah. can't help ourselves, yeah. kind of. Well, and then you're like, well, I, I can sort of see the context, and maybe the teacher can't, but the older they get, the more I have to take a step back and allow it to be what it is, and that is very difficult for right. me, because I'm like, yeah. come on, man. Yeah. And for me, I was always a very good, I was a good girl, and I got you know good right. grades, and I did, and so to have kids that aren't as interested in that uh mode yeah. is a like a beautiful lesson for me in learning to let them be who they are and not try and make them do you myself. know uh, do you know uh the work of john uh dr jonathan height h-a-i-d-t by any chance at what? nyu I, what's does he's got a bunch or, of books okay. out um some are on politics, some are on, he has a book on happiness. He kind of was one of the first people that wrote a positive psychology data-based book on happiness. That was like 15 years ago. Well, do you remember what it's called? I mean, this Google is when, it? I know. Jonathan Haidt, happiness, the happiness perspective, the pursuit of happiness, the happiness zone. Something with Something like word. that. Anyways, he's got, and I can send you the, the information, he's compiling a, uh, data, real hard data about the uh, mental health epidemic with young people, mm. which as you know, is just off the charts. Off. And one of the things he's arrived at is that helicopter parenting is really, really bad for kids. Yeah. And he talks about like the free range parenting, you know, the woman that was like arrested for letting her nine year old, like go to the park down the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, so the uh, this whole idea of like over molly coddling kids and taking away consequences, taking mm -hmm. away skinned knees, mm -hmm. um, uh, letting them learn by failing, um, which you know we've struggled with. Listen, I can talk a good game, but you want everything for your kids, you know. And um, but that's one of the what's one of the indicators because what it does is it takes away resilience and yes. you know. In the positive psychology movement, they've kind of really pinpointed this kind of like astounding lack of resilience among young people that you'll see. Like they'll have a setback. Someone will say something mean about them online or something like that, and they won't come out of their bed for a week and right. be in tears. Right. And they won't be able to function. Right. You know, I know, you know, teenagers that I've, you know, met or worked with or whatever, and they'll have a bad breakup and then they just won't do their homework for weeks. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. When we were in high school, right. I mean, I'm a little older than you, but when 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 we were in high school, like you had breakups and you did your and you homework, kept going. Yeah, yeah, and you just absolutely. had to keep on with your commitments and absolutely. stuff. So, um, I mean, it gets a lot more deep and more complex than that. But these are some of the indicators that uh, they've been looking at, and uh, he's got a a couple of books coming out next year, and I'm actually going to be speaking with him in New York soon. And cool. Uh, his his work is really phenomenal. Around awesome. Us. Yeah. What did you find it? The happiness hypothesis. The <laughs> happiness hypothesis. It's fantastic. Okay. I it's will check filled it out. with Buddhism and positive psychology okay. findings, kind of cool. Uh, uh, interwoven. Yeah. I. You know, it's funny. I was. I had. I was a little delayed this morning because I had a call. My oldest son is very. From the time he was little, he cares so much about school. He cares so much about his grades. He is the top of his class. All, and that is not for me. I am total hippie. I have like sort of wish that when he graduates high school, he'd take a gap year and like yeah. travel the world and smoke some pot. Like just go live for a minute because that's life. But he is has a one track mind. So uh, as he goes into the next year of high school and we're moving back here, he applied for a really specific private school that he very much wants to go to. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's pretty far along in the process. And this morning we had interviews and um, they interview first the kid and then me. And, you know, he's buttoned up and he's ready to go and he's got, you know, all the yeah. things. And then here I'm like, hey, you know, on this <laughs> call. And she, after she was done with him, she had time with me by myself and she said, you know, the question I always ask parents is how will they handle coming to a school that's much more rigorous and his grades will drop because mm. he's been straight A's top of his class his entire life. And yeah. if he comes here, there's just no way because it's a, an adjustment period and it's a lot harder here. And what will that be like? And how do you feel about it? And I said, Oh, be 
very difficult for him. Mm. But I actually think that's great. Yeah. I actually think him having some something to strive for and something to work on and not being perfect, perfect all of the time yeah. is a great lesson. And even this process of him applying for the school and he really wants it. Um, if he doesn't get it, I really believe that's not what was meant sure. to happen for his life. And even that disappointment, yeah. I think, is very helpful for him because life is going to be filled with moments where you think this is exactly what it's meant to be. And actually, God and the universe was guiding you to something much better and you couldn't see it at this well, point. Well, I think uh, failure is uh, so important for being a human being. Yeah. And, you know, in my advanced age, Rachel, <laughs> I you're, you, I have the benefit of, you know, the, the hindsight and kind of looking at that. And I think I imagine a lot of listeners do too. Of like, you can look through your life and go, wow, what key failures actually became transformative successes? And I know for me, like I got cast in this Broadway show when I was um, a, a struggling actor in New York, d dirt broke, trying to get by, catering, waiting tables, driving a moving van. And I got cast in a, in a Broadway play. And I knew it was coming up in like five months. And it, that created all this pressure because I was like, oh my gosh, I have to be really good because I'm going to get a New York Times review and I'm going to sign with the William Morris Agency and maybe I'll get nominated for a Tony Award. And I had all of this kind of stuff going on. I was all in my head. Um, I had a terrible rehearsal process. I was really second guessing myself the whole time. I was very tense, very sweaty. And you know, sure enough, I did a terrible performance. I was bad. I was B-A-D. I was really bad. And people are like, oh no, I'm sure you weren't that. No. I was really bad. I was, a, if you had seen that play, you'd be like, that guy's not good. Right. And um, it was hell. It was hell. There's nothing worse. Well, there are things that are worse. <laughs> um, cancer's worse. There's, there's very little that's worse than knowing you suck in a Broadway play. Yeah. And you're doing eight shows a week and you're, and you're on it for six months and you're showing up and you know you're bad and you're trying your best and you're trying to make it better, but you can't really at that point. And it goes on and on and on, show after show after show. I would, my wife was going to graduate school at the time. I would sob to her in the middle of the night. And I just, it was just horrible. And then it ended and I fired my useless agents. And I was just like, you know what? Screw that. I'm never doing that again. I'm never going to try and please other people or do something in some way that I think people are looking for and put that kind of pressure on myself. I need to be me. I'm quirky. I'm weird. I need to bring who I am to my roles and not try and be some like ideal Tony nominated New York actor. And I get my clothes at thrift stores and I wear glasses and this is who I am. And, uh, I found my voice through a horrible failure. Bad reviews, bad reviews. Yeah. You're a young actor. You're just out of acting school and you get bad review in the New York Times. It sucks. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. And, uh, and I really believe that I would never have gotten the office had I not gone through that failure on Broadway. That, yeah. the, uh, that enabled me to play kind of quirky, weird, alienated characters in a way that a few years later, five years later, six years later, I was able to, you know, to land, land the office thanks to one of my biggest failures. In my yeah. Life. Honestly, the, um, it reminded me of something my dad has said to me a lot in the course of my life is that most people quit when they're one inch from rock bottom. So meaning one inch from rock bottom feels terrible like mm. everything feels like it's going wrong your dreams are dying it's not what it is but you don't you don't know what to do and so you just sort of keep treading water one inch from rock bottom but if you just allowed yourself to own yeah that this sucked that this isn't what you wanted it to be and that you really didn't show up in a way or it failed in a way or something here isn't right mm. if you allowed yourself to hit the bottom you could kick off you could use that as a platform to go back up to the mm, surface. Mm. But most people will stay right there and nice. not make a change to 
to move in any other trajectory because they just think, well, if I don't do anything, at least it can't get worse than this. Right. But there's right. power in just owning it because when you own it, like you did, you go, well, why didn't this work? Why does this feel so awkward? Why is this not um, fleshing out the way that I want it to? Yeah. So um, something very similar for me is I've done this show for six years. And I made the decision a couple months ago that I would only do interviews in person now. Mm. And that's a bold choice because you can get all sorts of people if you're willing to do Zooms. a Zoom interview. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, I don't feel like the quality of our conversation it's true. is the same. It's 100%. And in fact, I was talking to your tech guys here, producer, about that. And they're like, oh, you drove all the way in here. I was like, listen, podcasts are better in person. They are. You, it, they're it's 15, 20% better when you have that connection yes. and you're sitting in a room yes. and it's a much more natural pace of conversation. And there's decent Zoom podcasts. There's good ones out 100%. there. You know, you can find some, but um, if you, yeah, if you want to kind of build something better, it's, right. it's much better. Well, and I also think for the audience, it's a better, more interesting conversation. If I'm able to guide some people, are not very good at a conversation and it gets a lot more difficult if there's a screen in front of them. Yeah. So if you're, I know I'm sweeping generalization, but if you're an academic, if you're a scientist, if yeah. you're a doctor, those conversations can feel a little bit more stilted. But if yeah. I'm sitting with someone in my house and mm -hmm. I you know, found the green tea and what, then it just feels so much better mm -hmm. and is a better process. But that only happened because we did, you know, 50 Zoom, interviews that I thought really sucked. And I finally had to own why I didn't think they were great. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> the last 50 Zoom interviews right. that Rachel did Sorry, sucked. Matthew and, McConaughey. Uh, <laughs> Jay Shetty. Uh, <laughs> no, for real. Um, but that's also you having to make a choice. That's a bold choice yeah. to say, I'm going to show up as myself in an industry that has a very specific ideal of what an actor is. Mm. And mm -hmm. then it's not ironic at all, but then you land this character that is so quirky and interesting and like something we had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And would that have happened if you weren't showing up as you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it helps you find your voice. And it, it, it's interesting, the story you told about your dad and like an inch from rock bottom. I have, a, I have a good friend who I know he's just been struggling for a long time. He's in the show business world and producer and director and whatnot. And I just knew he was just very unhappy for years and he was just complaining and seemed miserable and he tried moving and that didn't really work and he tried this and that and he was just really struggling. And then finally, you know, I I called him and he's like, I'm, I'm gonna need to, you know, wait a while to call you back. And, and then I spoke to him and he said like, I had a straight up nervous breakdown. Hmm. I really hit bottom and I just, it was just like, textbook nervous breakdown i couldn't move i couldn't get out of bed i was in tears all the time um and and now he's like he's cleared the decks and he's just like anything that is not important to me i'm putting aside he's focusing on his family his recovery right now like the one or two projects that he's really passionate about and you could hear a kind of a clarity in his voice in a way because he allowed himself to Maybe he didn't allow himself. Maybe it. Maybe life did it for him. Yeah. But life picked him up and slammed him on the ground in such a way that I truly believe that had he just hovered in a state of chronic dissatisfaction, um, he never would have kind of found, you know, his 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 mission. And uh, you know, this goes to kind of a, a spiritual concept that I'm really. Uh, interested in and I, I try and address in my book which is suffering and why there is suffering why why from a spiritual perspective is there suffering why is there why did god not make a world in which we just all had nice lives yeah. why do kids get cancer why do car accidents happen to teenagers why do really good people bad things happen to them like and that's a it's a tough conundrum you know and it's i don't pretend to have the answers but when you look at the Buddhist tradition and the Buddha, you know, the four noble truths and the kind of the essential teachings of the Buddha is number one, like life is suffering. But then when you look at that word suffering in the Sanskrit and the original translation, the word was dukkha, which means 
essentially, it's hard to describe, but there's so many variations of what the word means, but it essentially means dissatisfaction. It's like life is dissatisfaction. It's not really suffering as like, it's, it's, it's a wrestling with and being and things not working out and the you being at odds with outcomes, right? And trying to control outcomes and whatnot. And um, I just, that helps me so much just kind of going to that teaching of like, life is suffering, life is dukkha, like as I wake up, Rachel, a lot with just a chronic dissatisfaction. Like, a, why am I not being offered that role? And why didn't this work out? Do you and, really? Yeah, and why yeah. didn't this person call me back? And like, and how come this didn't work out the way I wanted it to? And gosh darn it, like, how come we're out of my favorite corn chips or or whatever it is? But they're, so I, I have to do a lot of work because I'm also a very anxious person. I suffer from an anxiety disorder and I've had a lot of issues with anxiety throughout my life. Like, and that goes hand in hand with dukkha, with with this chronic dissatisfaction of like, I have to do work to rectify that dissatisfaction on a daily basis, which I'm so grateful for. Again, so we talk about like how failure, how suffering can lead us down a, a good path. Like I'm so grateful for the fact that I have to get up in the mor morning and read some spiritual writing. And when I am when I have my shit together, you know, do a cold plunge, um, do some exercise to kind of be in my body, take just even a simple 15 minutes on and meditation and prayer and kind of realign. I have a gratitude text chain that I do with my friends cool. and like these things that help me realign my day because we go one day at a time from a day of chronic dissatisfaction to a great, to a day of surrender, a day of, of peace, a day of like, uh, in the Baha'i faith tradition, they call it radiant acquiescence. So uh, living in a state of radiant acquiescence, which I struggle with, and it's not always, it's super difficult, but it's it's a daily battle. But I think the, the Buddha frames it so beautifully, but I think that goes along with what your your father was also teaching. Yeah. Was there a time, I have about 50 follow-up questions from what you just said, okay. so I'm really excited. But was there a time in your life where you woke up and didn't feel that dissatisfaction? I mean, when you're when you have the dream part and everything's clicking, like, did you feel it then? Is it something that's always around? Yeah, it's. I view it as kind of like synonymous with diabetes. So diabetes, obviously a lot worse. I'm not trying to compare it, but diabetes is a disease you can live with, right? The disease of anxiety and of chronic oh, dissatisfaction. I'll, I'll go. Yeah, is I a got disease you live you. with, and diabetics can have a rich, amazing lives, live to a hundred, run marathons. They can do run corporations, anything that they want to do. But on a daily basis, yeah. you've got to check your blood sugar level and your insulin, and watch your diet, and you know have occasional blood tests and check-ins with the doctor and blood pressure and whatnot. And if you do that daily work, you can live a rich, full life. And I view kind of living with anxiety and living with dissatisfaction like that. So are there days? Yeah, there are days. There's whole weeks where I'm like, I wake up, I'm like, I am in the zone. I am living my best life. This is exactly what I want to be doing. Someone asked me recently, they're like, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? Uh, it was Dr. Arthur Brooks, who you should have on your show. Oh, I'm it, literally trying to get him right yeah, now. Yeah, he's amazing. Love, he's amazing. Oh, what's it called? Uh, what's the book From about? Strength to Strength? Yes. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I'm reading it right now. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, he's like the busiest guy in the world. So, I know. And he's doing a whole thing with Oprah. So, of you course. Know, wait in line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting. But he said, you know, what do you want to be doing in 10 years? And I, and I thought about it. And I was really like open and I was like, I want to be doing exactly what I'm doing right cool. now. I, there's not any other yeah. something else. You know, I want to be doing some acting and some writing, directing. I want to write books. I want to talk to interesting people on yeah. podcasts. I want to be with my wife. I want to travel the world. I want to, I want to play competitive tennis and you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm doing it. Yeah. So, and, and then, so I just felt such a uh, relief and satisfaction there around that. But you know what? I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be like, God damn it. A pharmacy didn't send chips. my 
blood pressure medication yeah. and where are my chips and yeah. you know, how come That's how true. come he got that role in that movie yeah. and I didn't yeah. 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 and my wife was mean to me and <laughs> you know yeah yeah is the anxiety something you've had since you were a kid well yeah let's go way back my mom left uh me and my dad when I was about a year and a half yeah, I read that. uh and uh then I and then he remarried and that was not a very healthy or loving or supportive family environment either. So, you know, I've just been in therapy for 20 years and, you know, there's, that will, that will, that kind of trauma will fuck you up and that will, uh, that'll mess you up and it'll give you anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I'm, you know, I've made up with my, my birth mother who I didn't really get to spend any time with till I was 15. Um, and you know, I've done a lot of work and, uh, it's, it's been, it's been a struggle, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, so it's something I had as a kid. It's something I, I, when I was living in New York city in my, in my twenties and I had grown up a member of the Baha'i faith, and that was my parents' religion. And then I, when I, when I moved to go be an actor, I jettisoned anything to do with faith, religion, spirituality, morality, anything like that. I just wanted to go do my thing in in the big city and be in my twenties. But I really was uh, had some very serious what now we look at as mental health issues. Um, at the time, in the nineties, no one talked about mental health issues. Right. It's just like everyone was depressed and anxious and confused and alienated. And we just kind of dealt with it. And, um, but I was having chronic anxiety attacks and uh, a lot of addiction issues to drugs and alcohol and, and, you know, anything else um, that I could get addicted to. And that I, um, uh, that uh, this, again, this, I was trying to medicate and escape this anxiety that really at the core, it's an anxiety disorder. Yeah. And my therapist is amazing. Sorry, I'm going on and on. No, my, I love it. My therapist uh, uh, is really great because anxiety is really the, um, is the disease of the modern age, I think. And it underlines, it underlies so much of what's going wrong in the world. And it's something that needs to be dealt with. And he always says like, when you're in anxiety, it's because you don't know what you need. So he's always turning like, you're, when you're feeling anxious, you stop, you breathe and go, what do I need? Mm. What do I need on a core level at my, in my deepest self? What do I, do I need a hug? Yeah. Do I need a nap? Do I need some validation? Do I need some reassurance? Do I need to meditate? Do I need to exercise? Do I need to talk to somebody? You know, what are these like essential human things that I need? And and so being able to self-diagnose what I need, even give myself a hug and do a little self-care or something like that. Or or what do I need? Maybe what I need is to reach out and do some service for someone else, yeah. you know, and do something good for someone else. But that's how you address anxiety. Anxiety is like a series of unmet needs. Yeah. That I mean that that really resonates with me too because when I'm anxious or in the past when I was having an anxiety attack it's it's fight or flight and what I want to do is just like get away from this feeling. Mm. So get away from this feeling by numbing it or get yep. away from this feeling by just going and doing something else so I'm not thinking about yep. it. But what you're suggesting requires us to slow down and get grounded and ask some questions, which is something I've learned to do later in life. But for years, I didn't have coping mechanisms like that. I had really negative coping mechanisms. Yeah. Um, so I really resonate with that idea that like there's something in that moment you need. Because when I was younger, I would say like something's wrong. And I remember my ex-husband would be like, what? What's wrong? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know, but it's something yeah. Yeah. and I can't fix it. So I yeah. would drink because I didn't know any mm. other way to manage those feelings. And if I thought, man, if I could just have a drink right now, it would just slow me down enough yeah. to that. I don't feel this. Take the me. edge off. Take as the they edge say. off. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it just, you know, you need more and more to take the edge off and yeah. it becomes this uh, really negative cycle. 
Yeah, and that's my one of my fears uh, about this mental health epidemic, because I do a lot of talking about it and talking to young people about it and speaking on my college campuses and whatnot. And um, and I address it in my in my book as well. Like one of the things is like you just said it, and it's it's medicating and distracting yourself yep. from the pain of being alive, from the dukkha, from the dissatisfaction, right? So what do we do? You know, alcohol, sure, right? And now and now it's kind of like this free for all with pot. And there's a pot store on every corner, right. and it's kind of like, right. hey, it's totally safe. You can't OD from pot, right? Well, that's true. You can't OD from pot. But you can medicate yourself using it every single day yes. in a way that doesn't allow you to really dress the underlying yes. anxious need. Yes. And your phone, my phone, I'm so addicted to my phone, mm. you know, like social media, getting likes, uh, making sure you're responding to texts and emails, constant distraction. Like I need to, like, when am I alone with my thoughts? You know, instead I can just be look at YouTube videos of right. like otters dancing in the kitchen or something. So that's a distraction, right? Anything that medicates and distracts us from the essential uh, pain of being alive, because right. it it is it is painful and joyful. And there is joy in that pain. And there's pain in that yeah. pain. Well, I love that you brought this up, because I'm asking kind of everybody that is interested in spirituality or faith or any of it because I'm fascinated by the idea of spiritual bypassing. Uh, so I feel like this is obviously the work we're like making That's as not hard work as in the possible. Future. This is to, like an obstacle course. To get, to get I know. I'm like, this water. is um, that next time I'm back, I want this fixed. Right. It's done. You Two got tables. It. You got it. Right here. <laughs> um, so hard to get good know, podcast help these days. It really is. Uh, yeah, that I, I see this more and more that with this beautiful wave of more people embracing spirituality and learning meditation and, you know, doing journeys and go the whole thing, like I'm here for whatever helps you become who you want to be. But I do feel like there's a lot of people who are getting so into that path that like you're never on this plane. You're always doing ayahuasca in a jungle. You're always medi you're meditating now for four or five hours a day. You're incredible. But I thought that the whole idea was that we were incorporating these practices to learn how to be in this life, to learn how to be on this, to be grounded here and do it. And here, it's hard. It's hard days. It's, you know, dealing with relationships and children and work and bills. And But that's, that's why... I thought we were developing the spiritual practices in the first place to make us stronger for here. Yeah. But what I feel like I'm seeing in friends and colleagues is you're dipping out more and more, but it feels healthy because, well, I'm not doing drugs. I'm not having alcohol. I'm, I'm like, yeah, but you're also on some level disassociating with your real life on such a constant clip that I wonder where this leads to. Well, I talk about this in my book, um, in Soul Boom, because... Uh, I view uh, the spiritual path as a twofold path. So, uh, and I compare it early on in the book, because I try and bring a little comedy to the equation, to two great 70s television shows. Yes. Uh, Kung Fu and Star Trek. Okay. So Kung Fu, for those who don't know, is about Kwai Chang Kane, who is kicked out of the Shaolin Monastery, and he goes to America as a Chinese person in the cowboy days in the 1880s, and he's wandering looking for his brother, but he he fights Kung Fu and he has incredible wisdom that he gained uh, from his training at, at the monastery, you know, Buddhist uh, wisdom and Taoist wisdom. And so that's one path we take, all of us. We are all Kwai Chang Kane. We're all on a journey, on our path, trying to make ourselves better, trying to share our wisdom, trying to help people as we go along because he would always help people and fight like racist cowboys and stuff. And then the other one is Star Trek, which is humanity in Star Trek. What has happened in Star Trek that has allowed the Enterprise to take off and boldly search for strange new worlds? Well, there was a World War III on planet Earth. Things got really bad. And guess what? Humanity arose to the occasion, found world peace, conquered racism, conquered income inequality, uh, conquered sexism, um, 
and lives in harmony and lives in harmony with the planet and with science and technology and is then able to go spread around the universe. And, and so these are these two paths. So what you're describing, I talk about in my book as well, because, and it's a specific, it's especially a Los Angeles thing. Oh, it's so a Los yeah, Angeles yeah, thing. It's, it's a very, it's a very goop kind of centered mm -hmm, thing, which mm -hmm. is this kind of narcissistic, uh, everything is narcissism and like me, 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 how does this benefit me? And uh, essentially anything, it's a fine line because self-care is so important, but it's like this yin and the yang. We do self-care so that we can serve others, right? We we enrich our inner lives. We study holy writings. We pray. We meditate. We we do yoga or a physical practice. We we have devotion. We connect with nature. We do all of this work so that we can take that that mana, that energy, and we can share it with others, and we can serve others, and we can work at a soup kitchen and we can raise our children and we can volunteer at the school and we can raise money for nonprofits and we can help our sick friends and whatnot. And that's, and then that in turn feeds us again um, and recharges that spiritual battery so that we can go out and serve more. And so there's this constant yin and yang dance between that Kung Fu and that Star Trek part of ourselves because then humanity can progress. But as long as we stay in a kind of a spirituality that's all about, I'm gonna go do ayahuasca every other weekend and I'm gonna meditate four hours a day and have disassociate my spiritual practice from my daily life and my daily life of service to others right. and, um, a, and a mission and a purpose, then we're not gonna progress as a species on this planet. And guess what? The stakes are really high, Rachel. This is not, spirituality for me and what I try and bring up in the book is it's not a game. It's not a hippy dippy, airy fairy, vague kind of crystals and incense type of thing. There's nothing wrong with crystals and incense, but it's a tool that can transform ourselves so that we can help transform humanity and yeah. transform our culture and make the world a better place. And those are the spiritual titans that we really admire. Right, right. I think too that it's that mentality is often approached from a perspective of like, I want to be one with humanity and I want to help people and I want to be on a higher level and all of these things. And I, from an outsider perspective, I think it's the most privileged existence you could possibly have because I also see it amongst people who have a certain amount of money have the kind of jobs where they get to make their own hours, mm -hmm. have like they're existing in this place already because most people can't disconnect from life mm -hmm. on, you know, for right. weeks at a time and all. Yeah. So it there, I'm like, you're, it's you're a one, missing it's it. It's a 1% problem. Yeah, uh, it is. Because yeah. uh, you're not having to work 50 hours a week and yes, pay the bills and feed yes. your kids. And but it's also many of the people who are doing these practices also have platforms and also then are are sharing that like here's my morning routine i meditate for yeah. 19 hours and then i have a green smoothie and it's it, there's a, i i want to keep talking about and sort of keep pulling at the thread because i'm not hearing a lot of people not question i freaking love that like go deeper learn yourself do all the things but at the same time the point i think is to be here. It's exactly what you said. It's for service. It's for this earth, this moment. This is where we are placed. Mm -hmm. You can't keep escaping this and mm -hmm. call that living because it's not. It's it's another kind of numbing yeah. on some level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the real, you know, the real spiritual challenge is, you know, a mother of three um on her own in mid-America working in an office, trying to raise her kids at her church volunteering her time, right. trying to stay centered and focused and loving and be a good friend and a great mom. And, and that's really hard. And that's why I think spiritual tools need to be really practical and uh, not this giant, like I said, for lack of a better term, like airy fairy, kind of hippy dippy, vague thing, but that, you know, cold immersion is 
proven scientifically to help. You can do it in your shower. Yeah. You don't need a $3,000 yeah. cold immersion tub to yes. do it. Do you do it in the shower? Or do you have a, a I, fancy I do, tub? I do both. I got, yeah. a, I got a fancy tub How as well. How often are you doing that? Um, I When I'm really going good, I do it four or five times a week. That's great. Yeah. That's so great. when I'm not, I'm... I'm I, <laughs> you yeah. know, once or twice yeah. a week but you know meditation is something you can do anywhere yep. create that kind of sacred space and um a gratitude list is something that has been scientifically proven to help to stay in gratitude because gratitude is the antidote for dukkha mm. for suffering for yeah. for dissatisfaction yeah i can be in dissatisfaction but when i get on my gratitude text chain and i gotta find five things that i'm grateful for i'm like I had a perfect cup of coffee this morning. Yeah. My wife looked beautiful and I gave her a kiss. I, you know, I was able to connect with this old friend, whatever it is that I'm grateful for. And it could be super simple. Like I saw a butterfly this morning yeah. and it can be really vast. Like I'm grateful for my marriage or whatever that, that shifts that, that shifts that perspective. Yeah. I love the simplicity um, when I'm doing gratitude, which is just now sort of a, a, such a massive part of my life. It's just how I'm going through the days. Mm. Um, I love the little things. I actually, the, the big stuff I sort of don't feel as much, yeah. but there's a, a fountain out front and, um, birds love taking baths in it. Hmm. And yesterday there was a hummingbird taking a bath and I've never seen a hummingbird take a bath. They are moving. So, and I was just like, I, I'm still thinking about it a day yeah. later. I love the little stuff, uh, because I feel like you know, there's that old expression, God's in the details. Mm -hmm. And so when I see these little details that I think I am the only human on the planet right now seeing this little thing, what a gift, right. what a joy. Um, and that's also being in the moment. Yeah. So you're, you're able to take some breaths and witness a hummingbird taking a bath. Yeah. And that goes to the whole Buddhist idea of, of being in the moment, that the, there is only the moment. Yeah. The past is, doesn't exist anymore. The future does not exist that's that whole Eckhart Tolle kind of thing. So yeah. gratitude also, it also grounds you in that practice. And that's something that anyone can do. Yeah. I, I read something recently and started this and it's been really helpful for me to, at the end of the night, as I'm falling asleep to just, uh, cause gratitude has always been a morning practice for me, but to just run through a few things that you're proud of yourself for. Uh, because I, I'm an achiever and I can push really hard and that's where dissatisfaction shows up for me is like, oh, you should have done this and yeah. you didn't go to the gym today and you didn't do these things. There's some perfectionism yeah. in there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that practice of just what'd you do well? And it can be anything. Like you showed up in the right way with the kids or mm -hmm. um, you helped with this, you called this person, you went out of your way. It really is, I don't know, sort of reminding me at the end of every day, like, oh, yeah this is who you want to be. Mm -hmm. You're not this. Some part of your ego is the one that thinks that it's never enough, mm. but who you actually want to be in your core mm. is a good mama and a good friend and a good partner and to show up in the world well. And so that little evening practice has been really helpful. Oh, that's great. How yeah. did this, uh, spiritual journey evolve in, um, in an industry that maybe doesn't always support being grounded, being centered, um, trying to seek satisfaction, trying to seek presence. Like how has it changed as you've become famous? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of different, uh, great question. There's a couple of different issues around that. Like, you know, like we talked about, there is a kind of like a narcissistic navel gazing, uh, side of Los Angeles where people are, you know, that very privileged thing of like, you know, every other day I'm at the spa. It's like, well, guess what? You get to be at the spa every day. Yeah. So most people don't get to do that yeah. jerk. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but for me, what was more of a challenge was my faith is very important to me and my, the practice of my faith. And also these conversations about spiritual topics that, again, there's two sides of the spiritual conversation, right? There's the Kung Fu, there's the personal well-being journey, working on my spiritual virtues, becoming a better person. But then there's this other side, which is seeking kind of service to the world and social transformation and, and service work and, and whatnot. And being engaged in the, these conversations like we're having right now is my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. It's not among comedians in Hollywood. It doesn't really happen so much. Mm. And 
So I've always been this weird outsider, right? So when I was in high school, I played the bassoon. I had pimples. Yes. I was in Model <laughs> United Nations. I was on the chess team. Yes. Like I was the total dork and I never fit in. And um, and that was back in the 80s before dorks were cool. There was anything cool about it. And Dungeons and Dragons, the whole, the whole deal. And then I come to Hollywood and like everyone's a dork, you know, comedy people. Oh, I was a dork and we're all dorks and stuff. But I'm talking about God and the soul and life after death and deep spiritual conversations. And all these comedians and comic actors are like, what the hell is this guy? You know, because, um, you know, most people are, are you know, atheists or else don't think about or, or deal with kind of larger spiritual themes and topics. So to me, I just view it as like, I'm never going to fit in. I'm always going to be an outcast. I'm an alienated dude. And, but I have to be me and I have to be true to my voice. So that's been a, that's been a struggle. Like I'm trying to make it in Hollywood and build a career and I'm on the office. I'm trying to do some movies and, um, and yet I'm just fascinated by deep spiritual conversations that no one is interested in. And they just think I'm the biggest freak. <laughs> well, I am very interested in it. Jack's good. interested in it. You're in All the right. right place. Okay, good. Uh, where do you think we go when we die? Uh, I think go is the wrong word. Okay. So uh, here's what I know. Put everything aside. Here's one thing I know. I know one thing. I am a spiritual being having a human experience. Yes. So are you. You are a spiritual being. You're in the Rachel Hollis meat suit. This iteration. Yeah, yes. For hopefully 97 years mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. right? And... uh. And then your spiritual beingness, you can call it a soul or a spirit, or if you want, heart qualities, whatever you want to call it, the divine part of you, is going to continue on its journey. I don't know exactly what that looks like in the Baha'i faith tradition. You know, it's infinite worlds of God until we ultimately meet our creator. Um, and that doesn't mean like have tea and shake hands with God. Oh, you, you right. made it. Like it's like a video yeah, game or top. something. Yeah, it's... Um, but, uh, it's a journey into the infinite that is so glorious and beyond our comprehension that what we are doing in this physical world. And again, this ties back to suffering. Why do we suffer? We also suffer to gain spiritual virtues. So you go through suffering and hopefully you come out the other side, wiser, kinder, more compassionate, more loving, yeah. more honest. And these qualities are what we take with us when our flesh tuxedo falls away, as I call it, and we move on our journey. So where do we go? What happens? I don't really know. The one beautiful metaphor that's in the Baha'i writings is about uh, the baby in the womb versus humans uh, in their body. So the baby in the womb has its own reality, right? It's, we see it as a very limited reality. It's just sitting in an amniotic sac. It's growing eyes and ears and noses and elbows and fingers and fingernails and teeth and everything it's going to need in this world. It has no idea why it's growing teeth. Yeah. You think about a baby at eight month old in the womb, it has fully functioning eyes. Right. Like, what a miracle. It's got rods and cones and irises and lenses and, and it, refraction and it can see color and gradation and... Uh, movement and it's it's an, it's a mirror and it has the eyes are shut and it has no idea what it's going to do with those eyes, right? So that's what's happening to us in this world. So yeah. this we are growing our spiritual virtues and our our um, and those are what we take with us. So our loving kindness and I love that word loving kindness and it runs through all the spiritual traditions. It's a, certainly in Christianity and in Buddhism. Uh, this idea of loving kindness, it's its a little bit more than love and it's a little different than just kindness, but it's a kind of a radiant loving kindness. Like that's what we take with us. And you, you all meet old people and sometimes old people are, are jerks. You know, you meet an old person and they're like flinty and mean and dour, like Mr. Burns or something like yeah. that from The Simpsons. And like, I always think about like, oh, that's, I don't want to end up like that right. old person. Like, right. Then there's old people that are just radiant and their eyes are just beautiful pools of 
of light and they have forgiveness and, and wisdom and a gentleness, right? That's what we want ahead to be that. And because I, I feel like they're on that path. They're headed in the right direction on that yeah, path. Yeah. I think that we do life more than once. I ah, think, yeah, okay. I think I think that there we come back around. I do. I there's no way this is my first time here. There's just oh, no okay. way. Yeah. I I wasn't raised to believe that. I was raised in a deeply religious home. My father was a minister. Wow. Um, my grandfather was a minister. I was pretty indoctrinated. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I just can't. I can't imagine. I had this when I gave birth to my first son. Um, they put him on my stomach. And it was the most profound moment. I didn't have this with the other kids, but with him, I looked at him and I just knew him. I just, mm. I was like, oh, I know you. Oh. And I've had so many moments like that in my life where you meet someone and you're just like instantly like, what? You know, um, yeah. I had with my ex-husband the very first time I saw him, I was like, there he is. Like there, mm. there, there's that person. Um, so I just, I have a really hard time believing, and I don't know exactly how it all works out, but I just have a hard time believing that this is, that we only do this once. Mm -hmm. um, it very yeah. well could be. Yeah. Yeah. I think Who there's, knows, but that's. There's a lot of mysterious stories that you hear that make, make that feel. Right. True. Right. You know? Um, yeah. Do you feel like if you had a past life, do you have any idea like this piece of me, this part of me, this thing, like that, that's not a new characteristic. That's something that I had. You know, I think we all have these little shards of the divine within us. Yeah. And, um, are those shared? Have the, some parts of me been around before? I'm, I'm open to that idea. Yeah. You know, I just, it's not something I really explore because I always, People feel like, oh yeah, I'd pass live. I was an Egyptian queen. They're right. always an Egyptian queen. <laughs> I, know, I don't. No think one is kind of like I was a, a peasant in right. Ethiopia, right. you know, or, right. you know, that. And it's so you know, I don't, I don't know about that. And then I always wonder about like, well, why this planet? Why would you just come back to this planet? There's, there's a billion trillion yes. planets out there. Maybe we, you know, cycle through experiences yeah. as other beings yeah. on other galaxies yeah. or that are, you know not silicone based life or yeah. something like that. So I, I don't know. Right. I love, it's I, all a big mystery. Yeah. I love hearing other people's philosophies or ideas about it, even if it sounds absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of my bucket list things is to walk the Camino. Uh, are yeah. you familiar with the road? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, so when I started to research and learn about it more, which is what I do when I get a little, you know, idea, I just sort of chew on it for years before pulling it off. And Shirley MacLaine wrote a book about walking the Camino de Santiago. And I was like, well, this will be wild. <laughs> and reading her perspective of past lives and where we come from and aliens and or whatever it is, I was like, this is so incredible. I don't know that I believe this, yeah. but I love that you do. And that you're willing to say that out loud mm -hmm. because somewhere in the mystery of all of this, somewhere mm -hmm. in these collective ideas is some truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, having grown up in a faith that was very dogmatic and heaven we, and hell. Yeah. Kind of oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you are not allowed to believe anything, but what we believe. And if you don't believe this, you're a sinner. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I, as I've become an adult, my attitude is just like, whoa, you believe we were androgynous aliens? So cool. maybe, maybe what you are is a bodhisattva. So from Ooh. the Buddhist tradition, okay, the bodhisattva is a person that has achieved nirvana. They've achieved enlightenment over the course of their life. But instead of just then merging into the ether of the divine cosmos of the glory of creation, they choose to come back mm. to the planet and to serve others. Uh, so that's the idea of the, the Bodhisattva, cool. as the, the enlightened enlightened servant of humanity. Yeah, I feel like I would definitely keep coming back. I, I My boyfriend is the kind of being who, if he had the chance, would just 
you know, become light and become whatever mm -hmm. is after this. Mm -hmm. But I could see myself, my my spirit wanting to be like, let's go again. Nice. Let's be a golden retriever this time. See what happens. <laughs> a hummingbird taking a yeah, bath. Yeah, taking a bath. Mm -hmm. Uh was it did it feel daunting to write about your faith and your spirituality and your beliefs in a book? To put it all down in Yeah, print. and you know, I, I tackle in the in the introduction about like why the hell is the guy who played Dwight yeah, writing a book do. on spirituality? And um and so then I can I need to lay out some, you know, my background growing up as a member of the Pi Faith, my mental health struggles, some of the things that kind of led me on the spiritual path, but yeah, I just have ceased caring. Maybe it's something that happens in your fifties. Like I just don't, I just don't care anymore what people think of me. People are always mad at me on Twitter, and people are always mad for some joke I've told, and they always think I'm a weirdo. And there's, you know, there's oh, and it's like I can't control, right. you know, right. if you're in any kind of like twelve step or recovery program, it's like I can't control the actions and beliefs and yeah. thoughts of other people. Yeah, so I've just completely surrender that. I try and live my best life and. Yeah, it's it it was daunting, but you know, COVID was a um I hate to say this it sounds really selfish, but because people were dying, but uh COVID was very uh good for me because it cleared my schedule in a way that allowed me to kind of really pour my heart and soul into this book. Cool. And um so I had a three year kind of runway of of work on it and uh and I'm really glad I, I got to do that. But it was yeah, so that part was daunting, and then it was it was daunting to have all of these ideas that have been bouncing around in my head for thirty years, and and to try and give them shape. It's it's hard, right? You've written several. It's yeah. hard to write a book. It's yeah, really and it never gets easier. It never. Oh, gets really? Easier. Oh, yeah. shoot! I just turned to number ten. Never. Oh gets my easier. god! Yeah, it's always having written ten books, having sold lots and lots of books, and still. Probably five times during the process, I had a full breakdown, crying, just like, I am a terrible writer. Why mm. do I think that anyone would care about any of this? Why am I trying? Like, yeah. oh. And luckily, I've had enough practice to just keep going through the slog, keep allowing it to suck, sit in that tension, but keep writing. Yeah. Because for me, I know that a good book is not born in that first draft. It's born in the eighth edit or the ninth edit. Yeah. But I'll never get there if I don't allow it to suck first. Right, right. Was this your first or your second? Why do this I This is my like... third. Oh, okay, third. I knew you had one before. Yeah. Uh, the... the Bassoon King was the kind of <laughs> comedic memoir book that came before this. And then I co-wrote a book called Soul Pancake because I had a company oh, called yeah, Soul a... Pancake. Yeah, yeah. What happened with that? We sold the company to a... a uh, another uh, media company called Participant Media, yeah. and it kind of got melded in, merged in with what they were doing. They're much more of a kind of a larger film yeah. studio type of uh, of dealy. And uh, but yeah, we had a great we had a great 10, 12 year run. I remember that. Yeah, we did a lot of positive, uplifting videos. You and, did. Um, but we had a book that was a New York Times bestseller that was. Soul Pancake, Chew on Life's Big Questions. And that's where this whole process started of like, I love life's biggest questions. I'm the guy who goes to a dinner party and talks about death. Right. You know, I, and, right. and clears the room and yeah. <laughs> instantly. But I like to talk about. Death's an important thing to talk about. It is an important thing. It's a guarantee for guarantee. every single person. Mm -hmm. I was, I did a couple weeks ago, I sat with Ryan Holiday. Are you familiar with his Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stoicism. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he had... Uh, coin in his pocket. Memento Mori. Yes. Yeah. And he gave me his coin and I was like so touched. And he was like, I, I give these to people every yeah. day. And I was like, damn it. Uh, but I have, I don't have it now, but I have been carrying that in my pocket. The back right. of it says, um, it, like at any, at any moment it could be done. Like, well, which the, is such an important that, reminder. That, that, that whole um, stoic uh, philosophy was carried on in ancient Rome when a uh, Caesar or a general would be marching through the public to create accolades and cheers and parades. This they too would, shall pass. Yeah. And they yeah. shall have the person behind saying memento mori, like you remember you're going to die. This too shall pass. And we don't think about death or talk about it much in, in Western culture. And it's considered like taboo and Ooh, it's dark and it's gross and it's depressing. And I don't want to talk about it because it's depressing and it's, it's also very, very real. And if you look at human history, conversations about death 
um, and the pondering of mortality uh, have has been a constant uh, in every indigenous spiritual tradition and throughout all the world's faiths. And it, it is an important uh, way of framing life. And yeah. it doesn't have to be depressing. It can be incredibly uplifting to realize like, one day, and I don't know when that is, I could walk out of Rachel Hollis's house and right. get hit by a bus. Right. I don't know, but one day I'm not gonna be here. So every every breath is sacred, every heartbeat is important, and every day is a is a precious miracle. Yeah. I think that if if you have lived through loss, if you've lived through grief, if you've lost someone unexpectedly, mm. or perhaps a lot of people, that is that is what makes I don't know, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but having experienced a lot of loss, it makes me much less afraid of death. Hmm. If anything, when I've lost people, it's such an important reminder of like, did you tell everyone you love them today? Mm -hmm. Like, if this was it, are you proud of the way you live life today? Um, our, a couple of months ago- Did my, you tell ja Jack? I love him. I love that, him all the time. That he loved time. him? Yeah. I do actually send you pretty regularly a text where I'm like, I really appreciate you. Because Jack's worked with me for a decade. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. He's my ride or die. Uh, but yeah, I uh, a couple of months ago, my children's father passed away very unexpectedly. Mm. And he was 47. He was oh very my God. young. Mm, so um, sorry. Yeah. It's brutal, obviously, for us as a family and brutal for the kids. But no 47 year old dad thinks that the last time he hugged his kids was the last time he hugged uh, his kids. Mm. And I say that because maybe someone's listening to this right now who is holding on to shit they don't need to hold on to or mm. keeping up a grudge that doesn't freaking matter or they need to tell somebody that they love them. They need to tell somebody that they're sorry. They're or worried about shit that will not matter. Mm. You know, um, uh, Gary V always says this line that I love when he's talking about social media and people being mean to you on social media. He's like, if you are the biggest celebrity in the world and you die, you're going to trend on Twitter for 48 hours yeah, and then the world's going to move on. Yeah. Which is fucked, but true. Mm -hmm. So if you are not the biggest celebrity in the world, you're just you trying to do your thing. And I'm like, only going to trend for like <laughs> 18 hours. No. But like nobody's going to care. This will not matter. It, 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 and if it will not matter later, why are you letting it destroy your life and your happiness and your peace in this moment? Mm -hmm. That's that's a that's a beautiful perspective. Yeah, I um. I'm really sorry to hear about your uh, your ex-husband. And uh, in COVID, so many diseases were amplified. And I've talked to a friend, a cardiologist, who said that heart disease just went through the roof. Absolutely. So, and it obviously it's stress part of it, but also just like brokenheartedness yeah. generally. Yes. You know? Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Which isn't a very technical <laughs> medical term, no, but, but very it's real. true. Very yeah. real. Yeah. I lost my father early on in COVID to, mm -hmm. to heart disease. He was 79. Sorry. And, um, you know, we talked about the fact that we are spiritual beings and, uh, I, uh, we got to, uh, bathe his body to cleanse and purify the body in a kind of a ritual, um, uh, before he was put in the casket and he was not embalmed. He was also, I want to say to listening off, audience who wasn't um uh what's the word um when you burn up the body into oh, ashes um, uh, cremated cremated why am I, he was also not cremated because really cremation is really bad for the environment and mm. it uh it doesn't you yeah, know people talk about, about sprinkle before. the ashes but the ashes don't they don't help they don't nourish a plant right right you know like right. so Really, the best thing you can do is green burials, but that's that's a whole other. We should have a whole podcast on that. But anyways, so we got to purify the body. It was very tragic. It was sad. It was heartbreaking, sobbing, and really uh, beautiful at the same time. But that's again that reiterated that you talked about loss and the fact that we're spiritual beings. And seeing my dad's body just had this transcendent realization of, oh, that's not my dad. Yes. That's 
the body he rode around in for a long time. But when you see a just a corpse, sorry without, for lack of a better no, word, it, yes. without any life in it, yes, and you just see it's just this fleshy vessel. And yes. I saw his like eyebrow hair poking out and the you know the mole on his face and the shape of his hands and you know that filled with so much love for for that body and what it meant but it that wasn't him yes. and the, and I I got such a peace out of that vision yeah that it is yeah, this too shall pass even mm. from from this mm -hmm. um yeah I think that there's it it's a horrible I don't know maybe I shouldn't say horrible having experienced a lot of loss in my life I don't know there's not a lot that I fear and I'm saying that as someone who nothing has ever happened to my children I can't imagine what that would be like and I know many people have experienced it but I do feel like I have an acceptance of just like I don't know how long I have tomorrow is not a guarantee ever uh, I was talking with someone about this and they were saying, um, oh, maybe it was Joan Didion they were referencing, that she had written this story. And if it's not her, forgive me, I might be giving this story to the wrong person, but that she had talked about her husband dying. Yeah. And that- She wrote a memoir about it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was yeah. her, that he had a, a heart attack at the kitchen table, I think, mm -hmm. and that when it, it was a very long time ago and and it's when called the year of magical thinking there you go yeah um that when he died she ran to the refrigerator because she had written the number for like the hospital or she didn't know what was wrong with him and she was dialing the number and she didn't know he was already gone but that she remembered writing that number on her refrigerator and thinking oh i'm going to put this here in case someone in the building has an accident because when we think about death or we think about something bad, we think about it in relation to other people. You never think it's gonna be you. Hmm. Truly, you never are like, oh yeah, it's probably, but we. this is it, this moment, this is all we've got right hmm. here. Hmm. And this um, idea that like, oh, someday I'll make up with my sister. Someday I'll strengthen my marriage, someday, I'll grow my faith someday, someday, someday. Mm -hmm. Betting on someday is oof, it's a hell of a gamble. Yeah. You yeah. hear those stories about people who, you know, work to retirement and they work every day, you know, 14 hours yeah. so that they can retire and travel the world with their partner. And then, you know, the day after they retire, they die and it was all for nothing. Right. Um, right. Not to Living be like for retirement. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. dark and depressing. I actually find it really beautiful mm -hmm. because i think this is what it is mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. what it is mm -hmm. and um yeah i i don't know if there's something i'm giving the world in these in the next half of my life if we're talking about arthur brooks it's this idea that like you don't know and so make today something that matters right oh, beautifully said yeah this has been uh, a treat. This has been like a real delight for us. Oh. We as a team, we're so excited that oh, you're coming. Oh, my and, pleasure. Thank you so yeah, much for having me. so much cooler than we could have hoped for. So. I really am. <laughs> I really am. I'm pretty much the coolest. It doesn't um, get much cooler. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that people know about the book, know where they can grab it, where they can follow and get mad at you on Twitter. So yeah. So tell them all the details. Yeah, so uh, the book is called Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. Um, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, in but the next few weeks. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's uh just buy it wherever. Maybe support an independent bookstore. Yeah. Uh I have a show, a travel show about happiness yes. called uh, The Geography of Bliss. It's coming out May 18th, 2023 on the Peacock Streaming Network. You can watch all office episodes there and turn over and watch. Rain Wilson traveling the world looking for happiness Perfect. all around the world. When did you film that? Last summer. Oh, was it awesome? Oh, my God. It yeah. was amazing. Oh, cool. I thought The Office was the best acting job ever. Yeah. But then they're like, oh, we're going to pay you uh, to travel the world and talk to people about happiness. So you're going to Ghana and Thailand oh, and Iceland. Cool. Good luck. And I was like, oh my this God. This is the dream. This is amazing. Yeah. It's like Stanley Tucci has that show where he yeah. just goes and eats Italian food. And I'm yeah. like, how do we get <laughs> this job? Yeah, this looks that amazing. Yeah. yeah. This has been a treat. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I hope you have a great weekend, man. 
Thank you. You're welcome. There's always a part of you that feels like you have hardcore imposter syndrome. Mm. Because I, I wasn't anointed by Hollywood. 